Um, hey, Hello. everyone. Oh, hey. sorry. Hello. No problem. So, uh, welcome everyone. To the uh, to the first uh, contributed talk that we um, uh, selected uh, with the chairs, and um, it's a talk by Ulash uh, Yelmas, uh, Yelmas, sorry for that, and is a mm -hmm. bachelor in computer science at the wonderful Zoo Lab in, in Pomona College. And you have 15 minutes plus five minutes talks, so try to be uh, mm -hmm. on time to have plenty of questions and the ability of, of course answering to that. The mm -hmm. is yours. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon and good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Ulash. I go to Pomona College in the United States. Uh, I'm a computer science major with a passion for neuroscience. And I'm very excited and honored to be presenting my work to you at the moment. Um, let's get into it. So. I am going to be talking about distinct roles, roles of excitatory and inhibitory neurons, as well as distinct roles of inhibitory neuron subclasses in task learning, temporal scaling, and working memory when we train recurrent spiking neural networks on temporal tasks. So as a group, we care about computation, and we care about how do we understand the configuration of brain-like machines that execute computation? How do we understand roles of individual neurons as well as roles of neuronal classes um, via modeling? And we specifically cares about, care about tasks that have a temporal component to them. So we implemented a very simple temporal task that is the sine wave generation task and trained our recurrent spiking neural networks on this task to predict a sine wave at the end. More specifically, our sine wave, uh, our recurrent spiking neural network includes three input neurons, and we input a vector of amplitude, period, and time-like input values. And we ask our network to predict a vector that represents a sine wave at each point in time. So the vector that is the output vector you see has values. Each value represents the y-axis activation value per time step that corresponds to a sine wave. And this is the overview of our recurrent spiking neural network model. Um, the recurrent spiking um, section is the middle section, the hidden layer with 200 neurons, some excitatory, some, some inhibitory, and all sparsely co recurrently connected to each other. So we implemented two different models. Our simplest model includes one excitatory neuron type and one inhibitory neuron type. Figure two is a representation of the connectivity ma matrix between different neuron types um, with the connection probability averaging around 20%. Figure three represents the leaky integrate and fire equation and figure four represents a refractory period, which is a method we implemented to make sure that our neurons are not spiking every millisecond to prevent chaotic activity and to, um, just to maintain the critical dynamics of the network behavior. Uh, we further implemented a 4 to 1 E to I ratio as the matrix represents, as well as Dale's law, which indicates that uh, if any run is inhibitory, it stays inhibitory through training. If any run is excitatory, it stays excitatory. So our second model is essentially, it essentially implements all the biological constraints from the first model, except it also adds up three different types of interneuron types. So. Uh, up on, in addition to our excitatory neuron type, we implement PV, SSD, and 5-HT neurons that have been observed in experimental studies and previous studies. Um, figure two represents the connectivity probability of each neuron type with the other neuron type. And figure one is a good schematic of um, how those connections, how, how strong these connections are between neurons that are important that I emphasize. And, Again, sparse connectivity and Dale's law are also implemented. Figure two, uh, you shouldn't take it as a like one-to-one -one schematic of um, the size, like the number of neurons. So we still have four to one E to I ratio. So we only we in total have 160 excitatory neurons, and the rest 40 neurons are inhibitory and divided between three classes. So when we train our network two models on variations of our sine wave generation temporal task, what do we find? We get to explore roles of neurons in task learning, temporal processing, and working memory. So we 
first observed that neurons learn the task by phase tuning. Um, both inhibitory neurons as well as excitatory neurons we see get locked to certain phases, certain states of the output to derive dynamics for only those certain states of the output for our sine wave generation task. And when we observe this phase tuning behavior as well as general patterns of activation, we find different behaviors among our differently initialized inhibitory classes. So only by looking at the spike raster, we observe that all three of them have some neurons that spike continuously throughout the entire period to drive network dynamics. But PV and 5H2 neurons have some neurons that spike consistently in their tuned phases throughout that tuned phase, whereas SST neurons sometimes spike in a shorter time range um, as well as they, they seem to have uh, like a less of a spiking in a tuned manner. So we go ahead and analyze single neuron behavior that contributes to these different neuronal class behaviors. And first of all, we find that all 42% of all PV interneurons get phase tuned. And among the phase tuned PV interneurons, we find that all 100% of the phase tuned PV interneurons get phase tuned um, to strongly project to an oppositely phase-tuned excitatory neuron. So figure one is a good schematic of how PV176 neuron, which is an individual neuron that is only active for the negative half of the sine wave, projects to many downstream excitatory neurons, inhibiting them strictly for the negative half of the sine wave, making them active only for the positive half. So in addition to that, when we observe SST neurons, only 33% of all SST neurons get phase tuned. But when we also analyze the behavior of SST neurons, neurons that get phase tuned, we see a more complicated form of activity. So we see SSTs being strongly projecting to excitatory neurons that both get tuned to positive halves and negative halves of the sine wave. And we propose that where when PV strongly inhibits the excitation of certain oppositely state excitatory neurons and like causes an immediate reaction that contributes to the output, SST neurons have a more complicated, more gradual way of impacting the network dynamics to contribute to the output. And we compare our results to what's been observed in previous literature in Cortex and Tremblay paper published that PV neurons strongly project to the cell body close to the cell, um, axon terminal, causing an immediate change in a cell's depolar um, polarization value, causing immediate action um, potentials, whereas SST neurons tend to project more towards dendrites and the outer sections of the cell, adding to a more spatiotemporal, more gradual addition of depolariza depolarization, which is in line somehow with our findings in our recurrent spiking neural network models. So we propose that this different behavior among different interneurons um, supports very, various time scales in our recurrent networks, a like creation of various time scales, which supports temporal processing. So to analyze further how they support temporal processing, we divide temporal processing into different components. One of them is regulation of excitation in general. So we implement the variation of our sine wave task that only includes different amplitudes and uh, all the sine waves have the same period value as you can see in figure one and we find that our model with three interneurons performs significantly better for this task and here we can see that while our model with three interneuron types is able to clamp excitation at the peaks of the sine wave as well as just create a generally more like precise and accurate um, alignment with the target sine wave, one interneuron model sometimes can't really achieve those purposes. So we have established that inhibition and inhibition through various interneurons helps um, being able to regulate excitation better. So according to this hypothesis, we um, hypothesize that for a task with changing amplitudes, roles of inhibition is going to be significantly larger compared to a task with only changing periods and um, same amplitudes. So we create the red task, which is another variation of our sine wave generation task. 
And this is for both models, for 3i model as well as 1i model, we see that the average inhibitory neuron activity is significantly higher for the orange task, which is represented by the orange line, than the red task, which is represented by the red line. And excit excitatory neuron, average excitatory neuron spiking doesn't really differentiate between these two tasks. But this essentially implies that indeed inhibition is a strong contributor to clamping of activity for changing amplitudes when we have a variation of excitation regulation as a um, computational need of the task. And this is a schematic of uh, how inhibitory neurons that strongly project to some excitatory neurons inhibit activity to clamp um, the prediction at certain values to make sure that the prediction is more aligned with the target. So another component of our temporal processing and like our proposition that um, varied interneuron classes enhance temporal processing is through seeing that whether phase transitions occur more smoothly or not. So we previously looked at the peaks and the excitation regulation there. So we also proposed that with the three in the interneuron model, when the network and the dynamics change from one state to another state, one phase to another phase, the change is going to be smoother, uh, smoother for our sine wave task. And we indeed find that for the three interneuron tasks, there is less variance at points where the network is transitioning from positive half of the sine wave to the negative half of the sine wave, as you can see uh, by looking at the red lines here, and as the loss value also indicates. And lastly, the last component of our temporal processing and how like three inhibitor neurons enhance temporal processing is that we observe um, temporal scaling of firing activity and neurons that get phase tuned, both for inhibitory neurons and excitatory neurons. So for instance, this inhibitory neuron I've highlighted spikes three times at each phase when predicting a period with value 45, and it scales its activity and spikes longer and adds another inhibitory neuron next to it when predicting a um, period sine wave with period 83. Similarly, this inhibitory neuron also scales activity and this excitatory neuron also scales activity. Um, so Dean Bonomano's group at UCLA works on how neurons and um, recurrent networks encode time within that, and our findings that our neurons scale their activity to accommodate um, tasks with different temporal needs and accommodate extending of the temporal nature of a certain requirement is captured by their finding. So we've established that with three inhibitory neuron types, excitatory regulation and phase transition as components of temporal processing is better, and temporal scaling is a phenomenon that occurs with our networks. And so we introduce a last model, a last variation of our task, working memory task, where we provide amplitude and period values for only the first 10 milliseconds. And for the rest of the 290 milliseconds, we provide values of zero. So we essentially ask our network to be able to remember those values, to be able to predict the sine wave. And we find that for the control task, that is not the not, uh, non, non, that's not the working memory task. We find that average inhibitory neuron activity is significantly higher um, compared to the average excitatory neuron activity. But for working memory, inhibitory activity significantly drops and meets the excitation. And this indicates that for when a network loses its significant input that implies something about the output, uh, such as that is in the working memory task, the network maintains the output because it's a recurrent network. Uh, it maintains the output via decreasing inhibition by supporting the uh, sustenance of that first 10 milliseconds of the output through the recurrent dynamics of the network. So we've established that three inhibitory neuron types create various time scales because of their various initialization of their connectivity probabilities and their beta membrane constant values. And we have shown that they contribute to temporal processing via excitation regulation and phase transitions. And other features that other phenomena we observe happening in our networks is that neurons get phase tuned to specific states of the output and neurons scale their activity to accommodate differentiations and periods, differentiations in um, temporal tasks lengths. 
And uh, for working memory tasks, we have identified that inhibitory neurons decrease their activity to accommodate sustaining um, the lost information through recurrent dynamics. And so what do we do now? Um, here, I'd like to take a second to um, acknowledge my lab members, especially my co-author, um, Antara Krishnan, as well as my PI, Dr. Yuching um, Zhu. And so in our lab, well, which has a lot of members, we are working on developing um, better and different temporal tasks and testing our network with three inhibitor neurons on different temporal tasks to see if these activities apply to many. And we are building more realistic models, um, trying to implement morphological differences and physiological differences, as we have seen, um, physiologically projecting to the cell body is different than and PV and um, SST neuron projecting to dendrites. And we are trying to implement SDP in our models. Um, we are also working with evolutionary algorithms. Um, yes. And so I would like to conclude with coming back to how I started, that we care about computation and our brains are a very cost efficient system of com computing neurons and how do we understand their, beha their behavior, their individual components, neurons behavior, as well as different neuronal subclasses behavior via modeling. Thank you so much. <laughs> Perfectly on time, uh, Thanks a lot. And uh, so we have uh, we have uh, quite a, a lot of questions for your talk, mm -hmm. and uh, so we'll try to fit that in the four minutes and a half that we have uh, to catch up with the program. Um, so we have a question from Luigi Rosati. Uh, did you try removing part of the internal run in an ablation-like study? Do you get it? If you remove one type, is, is yeah. this combination of interneuron types a sort of minimal set? Um, is is there a way for um, them to elaborate on what they mean by minimal set? I'm going to apply the ablation. Um, I'm going to answer the ablation question, but yeah, uh, what go, do go we ahead mean by with the ablation first? Yeah, um, so we, we haven't experimented with ablating a specific interneuron and seeing if the behavior changes, but that is a great way to further um, like increase and um, improve our argument that they take different time scales by seeing if the behavior changes. Yes. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Another question will be uh, that uh, that's by Aditi uh, Bishnoi. Uh, how mm -hmm. does strength or tendency of phase locking differ for excitatory and inhibitory neurons in the task with changing amplitudes? Oh. Wait, it moved. Um, uh, in experiments, internal neurons show strong modulation by the amplitude of slow oscillations. OK, um, can you? The first part of the question, I think they asked about. Um, How this... does strength or tendency of phase locking differ for excitatory and inhibitory neurons in the task with changing mm -hmm. amplitudes? So if you change okay. the, the amplitude of the sine, yeah. wave, sine wave. Yeah, so the phase tuning behavior and the temporal scaling of that state tuning behavior occurs only when the um, temporal length of a particular state is extended. So like the temporal scaling occurs um, when uh, in the task with the changing periods, but the nature of um, that phase tuning behavior and how it differentiates between inhibitory and excitatory neurons for changing amplitude is in general for the changing amplitude task includes, again, a constant period between all test data, right? So their excitation more generally maps to um, maintaining, like excited, excitatory neurons get phase tuned um, throughout the entire um, phase length most of the time, whereas inhibitory neurons phase tuning differ a ver various between different inhibitory neurons and some get more shortly phase tuned, creating a more complicated um, effect on the network, whereas some get, again, locked throughout the entire duration of the phase. So it, it still occurs, that variation. And there is variation between inhib inhibitory phase tuning and excitatory phase tuning. OK, great. So I had I had also a question. Um, mm -hmm. I have to click here. Um, so I, I understand that for uh, to be realistic uh, biologically, you applied the daily slow. But if you get mm -hmm. rid of this uh, constraint and you, because you are interested in mainly in, uh, in the result of your optimization, uh, mm -hmm. 
and in the anatomy you you extract from this. So if you get rid of this uh, Dale's slow, do you get different results? Or do you think you will get different results? That is a great question. So we initially didn't implement Dale's law. So we have a set of results that map to that output. Um, so by Dale's law, for, for, for first of all, we so we mean that inhibitor neurons stay inhibitor neurons. And the way we initialize those neurons are by multiplying their weights by negative values and making sure that they stay negative. So whenever a neuron tries to, or whenever a weight weight tries to go from negative to positive, we clamp it at zero and create another negative weight to maintain that neg like the same number of negative weights. So when we didn't implement Dale's law, we saw that our inhibitory neurons and negative connections went to zero and all the connections almost like went to positive with like minimal inhibitory um, connections that sustains um, the excitation regularly. But we saw um, like the sparsity of connectivity completely vanish. So we implement 20% sparsity, right? Because when we don't enforce that Dale's law as well as the sparsity reinforcement, it just vanishes and the network ends up becoming a fully connected network of uh, sort. So the results change and the phase tuning behavior as well as different time scales behavior just disappear mostly. Oh, sorry, I have a, a clock. So where do you hear? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry for yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know okay. how to get rid of it. That's okay. Oh, it's here. Uh, uh, we had a, uh, the chance for a last one. And uh, mm -hmm. so you, uh, the different interneurons, you are, since you are uh, the creator of the network, you can do things um, that may not be in biology. So for instance, you may change the, same scales of the interneurons. And do you think this will play um, a big role in the emergence of different behaviors? Change the what of interneurons? Oh, the time scale, the, like the, 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 the time, time scale, scale of the synaptic uh, integration, for instance, of the normal modulators. Oh, that, yeah, that's an amazing question. So what we're trying to do like, as future works in our lab is again, implement more biological realism. And with that comes, for example, changing the firing threshold threshold of inhibitory neurons as well and change the synaptic connections. And like with those, when you change something that's intrinsic to the inhibitory neuron, their way of activity influences the entire network. So it would definitely change the way that network behaves if, depending on what feature you change in an inhibitory neuron, I think. Okay, thanks. Thank you a lot, uh, Ulash, and uh, your um, very uh, nice project. And uh, the next speaker is, is ready. And uh, thank you.